Did you know that while you're sleeping, the human heart pumps about five liters of blood every single minute, which equates to 30 times its own weight. And if it continued at this rate, it would pump more than 7,200 liters or about 1,900 gallons of blood each day. But the heart isn't always pumping at its resting rate. And especially if you exercise, that volume of blood pumped in a day could be over 10,000 liters. For example, an average male marathoner can pump up to 30 liters of blood per minute during exercise, with some elite athletes being clocked as high as pumping 40 liters per minute. So today, we're gonna take you on a tour of the heart. We're gonna show you the valves, the heart muscle, the chambers of the heart, and even show you how the blood flows through the heart so that we can appreciate how this incredible organ pumps millions of gallons of blood throughout our lifetime. Cardiac anatomical awesomeness awaits us. So let's do this. Here we have four hearts here. And the reason we have four here is because based on the dissection, we'll use different hearts here. But I've laid them all out essentially in the same way, meaning you can see the apex of each individual heart here, the tip right there. But what, what I love doing with students is showing them certain surfaces of the heart here. Let me do it like this. Now, if you look closely, you can see there's this flat surface on each one of these hearts here. Now, they're obviously different, slightly different shapes and sizes based on, generally the size difference is based on how big the person is. And so like Shaquille O'Neal would have a much bigger heart than say like me, who's only 6'1", and Shaq's like, what is he, 7'2", 7 7'1", something like that. So kind of cool to think about, generally heart size fits the size of the person, and we say sometimes the size of the fist, but that's just a rough estimate. But coming back to these diaphragmatic surfaces right here, I just gave it away. The diaphragmatic surface is the name of these flat surfaces because I love showing students how to orient the heart. So if I pick up this heart and I take that flat diaphragmatic surface, your diaphragm is this dome-shaped muscle, but the top of the diaphragm, where the central tendon of the diaphragm is, is flat. And this flat portion of the heart, the diaphragmatic surface of the heart, plops right down, so I'm gonna make myself a flat diaphragm right there. I'm gonna plop it on there, and then all I have to do is put the apex where it needs to go, as I touched my shirt there on accident. But the apex just needs to point slightly anterior to the left right there. And this is about how the human heart would sit in the human body, just posterior to the sternum there. And so I always hand these over to students and let them orient it, like make their makeshift diaphragm there and plop the heart down so they can get an idea of how the heart is oriented. But we're gonna use this heart. This is our smallest heart here. This came from a body that was actually five feet tall, so very small individual. And, but it's one of my favorites to teach from because it has a cool set of dissections that we can see here. So again, let me just orient you like so. This is about how it would sit in me. But to see the atrial chambers, I'm gonna twist it and show you the posterior view. So I'll kind of tip it up on its apex there and flip it around here. And these are the atrial chambers. I'm gonna let you see a closer look here, but here's what we're gonna see as the right atrium. And then we're gonna see the left atrium. Let me bring it closer to this camera here. So here's this open chamber right here as the right atrium. And then we've got the left atrium right here. Now what's really interesting about that is there's just a septum called the intraatrial septum, interatrial septum, that divides the two. I'm actually pinching that septum and the, my pointer finger is actually in the left atrium where my thumb is in the right atrium right there. And so let me just show you the internal anatomy here. Remember I said a lot of the atrial chamber is just smooth and that's when during embryonic development it pulled in some of the veins and made them part of the actual chamber. But this portion, remember how we said that pectinate muscle right there? You can see it, why pectinate refers to comb because it almost looks like, I, I don't know if you'd call them the bristles of a comb, but the pieces of the comb that you'd actually just kind of notice. Everybody gets it when you say comb. But again, what are we gonna do here? This atrial chamber is gonna contract slightly and it's gonna push the blood, that deoxygenated blood, through the tricuspid valve and enter into that right ventricle. So we've cut a window into the right ventricle here. And one of my favorite things to do is to show students more of that tricuspid valve. One of our hearts has a little bit of a better dissection for that. And I think it is this one, yes. So this one has a bigger window cut into that right ventricle. Look how cool this is. We've got that papillary muscle right there. And then you can see those little tendinous cords called the chordae tendinii. And then we've got it attaching to the cusps one of the cusps of that tricuspid valve. And that's that saloon door that we'd actually see right there. So the other thing that I wanna mention 
is that you can see the trabiculi carni. You can see those beams of muscle if you actually look closely there. You can see all that architecture and those beams of muscle that we see. But real quick, let me tell you about a lifesaver for you travelers out there. And that is the sponsor of today's video, Aerolo. You know that sinking feeling when you land in a new country and suddenly you have no service, which means no maps, no messages, and no access to Institute of Human Anatomy videos. And then to make things worse, you get slapped with a roaming bill so high, you start wondering if you accidentally bought the entire internet. And then you start contemplating selling a kidney in order to pay for it. Yeah, I've been there. Not the actual selling of a kidney, the roaming part. But Aerolo fixes that. It's the world's first eSIM store, trusted by over 20 million travelers, and it lets you download and install a digital eSIM plan before you even step off the plane. And they have coverage in 200 plus countries and regions, so you'll always be covered. No more airport SIM card scavenger hunts, no more desperate Wi-Fi searching at coffee shops, just instant, seamless connectivity. And it is extremely easy to use. You simply download the Airlow app, choose an eSIM plan, and then purchase your plan based on your destination. Like if you're traveling to Malaysia, you'd choose the Malaysia eSIM. Then you install the eSIM while connected to Wi-Fi and just simply turn on your eSIM when you arrive at your destination for instant connectivity. And as a bonus, you get to keep your regular number while using data from Airlow. So if you want stress-free travel, download Airlow today by visiting the link in the description and use our code ANATOMY3 for $3 off your first eSIM. Now, remember, we have the deoxygenated blood moving from the right atrium into this right ventricle. We don't want the blood to come back where it came from. So again, that right ventricle is going to, that I should say that tricuspid valve is gonna close. And then we're gonna have that blood leave. So this is really cool. We've actually cut open the pulmonary trunk right here. So that blood's gonna leave through that pulmonary trunk. We've cut into it and you can see the pulmonary valve right there. You can see those little tiny semilunar cusps. And these ones are not nearly as sophisticated as the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve. Essentially, the blood just passes by and shoves that valve open and kind of pushes it against the wall of the blood vessel. And then when it actually relaxes, I'll show you the aortic valve, how it would look kind of when it's closed here. Let's see if I can get that in there to your, oh, there we go. You can kind of see that in there, the aortic valve closed there. There's not much light going in there, but you can see those cusps down in there. If I get the probe out of the way here. Okay, now remember, I'm gonna step back here. I know I'm repetitive, but I think it helps everybody remember. Right ventricle contracts, opens up that pulmonary valve. The blood goes through the pulmonary trunk into the pulmonary arteries. We breathe out that carbon dioxide, breathe it back in, or breathe in the oxygen, reoxygenate the blood. And then the blood goes back to the left side of the heart, specifically the left atrium. So if I turn this over again, remember, here was that right atrium, the opening there, but here is the left atrium, right there. So again, very smooth. We've cut most of the pectinate muscle out of the way here on this particular section, but you can see that opening into that left atrium. Then we've got to go through a bicuspid valve or the mitral valve, depending on the anatomy book you learned, and now we're in that left ventricle. Now look how crazy this is. There's the wall thickness of the right ventricle. There's the wall thickness of the left ventricle. Huge noticeable difference that you can see because again, right ventricle is just pumping to the lungs, left ventricles pumping to the entire body. Speaking of the entire body, that's going to leave through that aortic valve and into the aorta, and here is that aorta. Remember how I said the aorta is the size of a garden hose? Let me pull the probe out of there so we can really see it. You kind of already got a taste of that when I showed you that aortic valve. Let me open it up here. But you can see how this is the size of a garden hose. Huge, huge, amazing artery here. And the last thing I'll mention on these heart dissections is that, ironically, the first place that we need to take oxygenated blood when it leaves that left ventricle is the heart itself. Here's that right coronary artery, and then we even have the left coronary artery. And you can see if we trace that down, it's distributing blood onto the heart muscle itself. And so pretty cool to think about. And these are the arteries that can get blocked with a myocardial infarction, which is that fancy pants name for a heart attack. And depending on where it's blocked, how big of a vessel, if it's one of these smaller vessels, 
it's going to be a more mild heart attack. If you block this one right here, for example, the left anterior descending one, that's often referred to as the widow maker because it's such a big area of the heart that that blood vessel serves. And some people will die from a heart attack that blocks that actual vessel there. Now, I do wanna briefly mention here because that was so long ago I kind of forgot about it. The, remember we mentioned the three layers of the heart, the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. We've removed the epicardium on the majority of these hearts, especially this one. So this is all myocardium. We've removed the epicardium. On this one, we've left some of it. You can see some of that fatty tissue down there. But we've also kind of removed some of it back, back on some of the muscular tissue that you can see like right there. We've exposed some of that myocardium, but here's a little bit of that epicardium. Remember that was epithelial tissue and some of the fat there. And just as a fun little factoid for one of our hearts, every once in a while when you actually are in a lab, we get the cause of death of all the people that we have or all the bodies that come into the lab here, but we don't get their complete medical history. That would be impossible to get their medical history for their entire life. So sometimes we get some surprises, like for example, this lead wire to a pacemaker, this heart, um, we can see the lead there. The actual unit or the pacemaker itself, we implant those in the chest, not we as in me, but in the medical community. And they put that more superficial, that's where the battery pack is and the control unit is. And that makes sense, because if you have to replace that, that'd be much less of intense or invasive surgery if it's just under the skin, rather than actually getting all the way to the heart itself. So the placement of the lead is very important because that's more of an invasive surgery that you actually have to place the lead in the heart muscle itself, but that lead will go out to the actual control unit where the battery is, and like I said, the control unit to actually control heart rate with somebody who does have a pacemaker. Thank you for watching today's video, everyone. I hope you learned some awesome and useful information about the heart. Like and subscribe if you don't mind. Leave some comments below, and of course, we'll see you in the next video.